morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Sir Meerkat, and welcome back to the Moto Meerkat channel, and welcome to another episode of the Chatterbox podcast. Now, obviously, we say in every episode that the guests we have on are very special, but today we are in for a serious, serious treat. I'm super excited to chat today with a man who has raced in Formula One, has raced at the Le Mans at 24 hours, and has even won the Indy 500 in his first attempt. Absolutely crazy, but please welcome Alexander Rossi. How are you doing today, my friend? Fantastic, man. How are you doing? Awesome. Awesome, mate. I'm doing very, very well. As I said before we started recording, it looks very sunny where you are right now. Where are you, sir? Very sunny. I'm outside uh, Daytona International Raceway in Florida. Um, 24 hours Daytona, kind of the the mm-hmm. week of practice uh, starts kind of tomorrow. So I gotcha. um, just had an IndyCar test yesterday in the middle of Florida. And so I'm sitting in a car in a parking mm-hmm. lot um, talking yeah. to you. So apologies for my background, but uh, here we are. <laughs> That's all right, mate. That's all right, mate. Daytona is a very cool background, definitely better than this room. So that's no worries at all. But um, it's amazing to have you here today. Uh, First driver I've actually had on Chatterbox. So we started off very good. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get much better than Alexander Rossi, but (laughs) well, we'll have to wait and see maybe at some point. But as you said, you had your IndyCar test yesterday. How did that go? Yeah, it was good. I mean, obviously, um, 2020 was a was a strange year for for us. Yeah. in every aspect of life, uh, mm-hmm. motorsports uh, notwithstanding. So it was just good to, to get back in the car, get back to work with the team. Um, you know, it's kind of a condensed off season for us just because the calendars all got shifted around last year. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was a good day. Um, we have another IndyCar test actually right after Daytona, the, the 24. So um, I'm spending a couple of weeks down here in Florida, which is better than, um, snowy Indianapolis and probably better than rainy England. Uh, but yeah, man, it's just great to be back in the car and, and getting back to work. Very nice. Yeah, very nice. Definitely better than rainy England. Are you uh, optimistic for, for 2021 then? For sure. I mean, it's. Uh, I think there was a lot of good things that came at the end of last year. We weren't able to really capitalize on it ultimately um but yeah i mean the, the, the car speed was back and um the team was kind of, of of clicking again for whatever reason we just we just didn't didn't do a good job at the, be, at the beginning of 2020 we had some things kind of not go our way we we didn't even start um three of the races just because of mechanical problems so i think that Difficult, from man. there kind of put us on our back foot and we we lost our way just with trying to make it all up and in, in, mm-hmm. in single events right instead of just doing what we know how to do so it's uh something that happens um but ultimately you know the the 27 andretti autosport honda team is still the same group of guys and um we we had a very successful test yesterday so we're back back to it and ready to put last year behind us awesome sweet i mean i look forward to to seeing you on track very excited very excited but let's have a little natter today just like all about yourself really so we'll go back to properly the start of your career so same as most people that that do motor racing you started out with carts now how did that actually come about did your mum or dad just sort of put you in a car and go there you go son have some fun or how did that kind of come about where you started racing in general so my I, I had no like my family has no motorsports background. Um, my dad was just a, a big fan of racing. He went to races with his father when he was younger, and so it kind of became from the age of three. Like our our father son yearly trip was we'd go to to um, actually IndyCar races in, in Northern California, and um, for my tenth birthday, he got me a a three day go kart school. Um, which was supposed to be kind of a, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And it was sold to my mother that way. And at the end of it, I was like, this is the best, best thing in the world. I love it. And the, the coach was like, Oh, he's, he's, he's all right. Like you should consider like taking him racing. And my dad was like, okay, sure. Like you're just trying to sell me a go-kart type thing. <laughs> and so we yeah. kind of left, left it. And, you know, I was just pestering them for, for a whole year. And finally, um, when I was 11, we kind of dipped our toes into the water with a, with an arrive and drive cart program. So um, I could go racing, but you didn't have the full commitment of buying buying yeah, yeah, go-karts yeah, yeah. And, and the trailers and all that. And uh, we, we won that championship kind of oddly. And, and so then my dad was like, oh, maybe we should actually pursue that. And, and the rest is history. So started full-time karting when I was 12. 
and then uh, that was pretty short lived. I got in a race car when I was 14. And, yeah. um, so it was a, a short car career for the most part, but, um, I think ultimately most of the skills you need to drive race cars, you acquire in race cars anyways. So. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But finally, uh, you finally managed to get in. And then when you're winning, that's what finally convinced your mum to allow you to, to go racing. That's, so that's the thing. Cool. It was, it was, it was winning. And like, as long as I was still doing school, like it was, yeah. it was okay with her. So as you've got a good balance of both, yeah, then you can yeah. finally please the mothers. Yeah, no, I understand that. I understand that. But as you say, yeah, the karting career wasn't particularly long, jumped into, into cars pretty early on. And throughout your sort of junior career, moving up the motorsports ladder, what series would you say did you have sort of the most fun or what did you have the best racing, the most pure racing in, do you think? Um, I mean, it's IndyCar, honestly, but like in, oh, really? in the junior levels, I, in the junior levels, probably, probably Formula Master, which was a series that was only around for a little bit of time and, and it, quick, it kind of transitioned into what GP3 is or what F3 okay. is now, I guess. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was kind of the same cars. The only difference was we didn't race with Formula One just to try and keep the cost down. But right. um, that was that was kind of the last level that I felt in in Europe where politics and and the business side of things didn't really play an effect. It was it was just guys who wanted to compete and win races, and, and that was really it. So um, kind of from that point forward, it became a lot more. I don't want to say serious, but, but intense, um, from the, the business side of things. And, and that always detracts a little bit from, from the joy of it all. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'd kind of assumed that maybe you'd enjoy a lower tier motorsport a bit more. Cause you kind of have that, that pureness, as you say, the lack of business element of it, but you said there that you, oh, well, that, uh, IndyCar was maybe the more exciting and pure racing. Why is it that you actually think IndyCar is more exciting than any of those junior categories that you did well because it's it's kind of the same thing that i just explained but like with real race cars that go 240 miles an hour right? <laughs> yeah, yeah so yeah. um so but it, it it has that grassroots feel to it that that um that element of just people who are there because they love competing they love winning and yes you know budget always plays a factor but i mean compared to europe like it's is relatively small. So um, you've got teams up and down the grid that can win races every weekend. And uh, yeah, that, that part of it is, is kind of what I fell in love with when I did my first race in IndyCar and, and why I feel so fortunate uh, to be in the series. Yeah, no, no, that's awesome. No, fully get that IndyCar is such an incredibly fun series. And we will definitely talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. But first, we'll carry on with sort of the junior career. So um, after that, you you competed in a thing called Formula BMW across Europe and the US, winning the US series, and then also winning the Formula BMW World Final, which meant that you then managed to secure a test with BMW Sauber F1 team at Jerez in 2009. I was hoping you could sort of just talk us through that whole experience and what it felt for the first time to get into a Formula One car. That was, I mean, I still can't believe that they allowed guys that win a Formula BMW championship or they allowed Seems guys a bit that mental, a Formula yeah. BMW <laughs> championship to like get in an F1 car. But um, it was awesome that they did that. And, and it showed kind of BMW Motorsports support for Formula BMW and the investment mm-hmm. that they were putting in to try and help develop young drivers. Um, exactly, exactly. But it was I mean, it was crazy. I, I mean, the, the biggest thing, honestly, was was the braking. So that's what everyone um, says, yeah. It's what everyone says, right? Yeah. And and I was so adamant because, like, that's all I had heard for a year. <laughs> that's all I had heard in the meetings and the days and on yeah. the track walk leading up to it. That I was like, I'm not going to be that guy that breaks for turn one so early that, like, you have to accelerate up to the corner. Well, what do I do? I, I sure enough, lock it up and go straight on. So yeah. I guess, I guess I failed in a different, in a different respect, but <laughs> I mean, the, just, it was, it was also just the magnitude of, of the team and then just the quality of the car. Like it, it felt like you were driving on glass and, and really that's the only car I've ever experienced where it kind of feels that way. Um, just because really for the most part, it's, it's, no expenses barred um to to build those race cars so Mm -hmm. what you're getting the end product is so refined and 
and um, so phenomenal that it's very hard for a spec car and series to compete with that. Um, but in, in a lot of ways, I was actually reading a quote from, from Kevin Magnuson, who had his first uh, DPI test yesterday. And he was like, it was so nice to get back into a raw kind of analog race car mm -hmm. because an F1 car just isn't that. So um, it's, it's funny what you take for granted being on, on each side of it. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, there's days where I'm like, man, I really miss F1 cars. And then, you know, hearing that from Kevin, it's like, Oh, well, what we're doing still, still pretty awesome. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Any sort of motorsports is awesome, but yeah, I guess F1's just kind of like that different breed, isn't it? That crazy top level thing sure. but yeah For yeah sure. yeah so you had that test in with bmw sauber and then it was a little bit later on where you were able to then get back into uh, an f1 car you obviously became the caterham test slash reserve driver and you were uh, raced for caterham not the f1 team but kind of like for their branded teams in formula Renault 3.5 gp2 and then from 2011 to 2014 Caterham kind of kept you on the back burner a little bit. And then you ended up moving from Caterham to Marussia Manor. So I kind of wanted to ask, how was that Caterham relationship made? And then how come they didn't end up putting you in an F1 car? And why did you then end up deciding to move over to uh, Marussia Manor? That's a that's a loaded question. Um, yeah. First of all, I'm, move, I'm moving because I'm leading in uh, my RV into a, a spot, but I'm I'm still oh. here, so don't worry. Um, gotcha. okay. So I I I became a part of Caterham through what was called the Air Asia Team Lotus Driver Development Program, and that was I mean that was before it was Caterham. It was it was called Team Lotus at the time, and um, gotcha. Tony Fernandez owned that race team and also owned the Malaysian airline Air Asia, and and they we're looking to, to create a driver program that kind of um, emulated that of, of the Renault Driver Academy, the, the Ferrari Driver Academy and, and all that sort of yeah. thing. So I kind of got um, brought into that through Alex Young, who was an ex um, Formula One driver. And they, from that point, kind of helped support my career through 2011 uh, when I was racing World Series by Renault. And then they actually had their own World Series team in 2012 in partnership with Arden. Yes. And um, that was, quite frankly, a disaster. So I left, I left a team that I had you know, built a really good relationship with, finished third in the championship as a rookie, and kind of went to a new team. And it, was, it started out tough just because it was, it was all new for them. Um, it ended up, we ended up getting pretty competitive, but... You know, we lost so much at, at the beginning of the year that we were really never able to recover from it. And the frustrating thing is the car that I left is the one that ended up winning the championship. So um, not saying Always that I would have necessarily done that, but it's just yeah. the, the team was just operating. At I'm, that sure level. Done, so it, I'm sure you would have done I'm sure you would have done it was difficult to uh, to watch to watch it be successful I after I was just I there. Um, so then, you know, that that was kind of fine. And, and they realized that. And so at the time. Um, there, they were, I think just getting into GP2 or they kind of had a partnership with the GP2 team, but nevertheless, 2013 moved to GP2. Um, and you know, they were, they were kind of a, a mid pack team and it wasn't until, um, kind of the end of the year where we found our stride and started to, to, we actually want to race the, the season finale in Abu Dhabi, um, and so everything was good. We thought 2014 was going to be this great year. We were fantastic in, in kind of preseason testing. Um, actually, I'm forgetting something. So 2013, actually, I was supposed to move up to Formula One after the year that we had had um, in 13. There was, you know, always, you know, there's always the conversation in F1 about budgets and, and all this stuff. And quite frankly, I never came. I mean, we, it was my my dad and I still, I never came from, yeah. from kind of huge family money. Uh, my dad is a landscape contractor by trade. So um, that was really never on the table for us to just be able to write checks for, for millions of dollars. And um, Guido Vandergaard and Charles Pick were kind of in a little bit of a different situation. So they ended up being, being the race drivers um, in 2014, which I was content with because they were, I was still going to be the reserve driver and I was going to have another year in GP2. And like I said, at the end of 2013, we kind of found our stride and everything was going well. Yeah. Well, 
preseason testing happened, you know, we're, we're competitive. Um, we, uh, I think we led two of the four days or something like that. And then there was a complete ownership change and personnel change and everything. And we go to the first race and uh, like we're last me and my teammate, um, who were, uh, I think it was Sergio Canamasas, maybe I, I get the years run together, but anyways, it went, it went sideways really quickly. Mm. And actually at the same time, um, that, like I mentioned, the, the ownership with the F1 team changed and the new ownership really wasn't interested in me being a part of that program, regardless of contracts or regardless of commitments and regardless of the fact that I was supposed to be in the F1 car anyways. And I was yeah. already kind of getting a consolation prize, if you will. So that, that relationship unraveled very quickly, but I need to, to clarify that it wasn't the relationship that I had had since 2011 it was a whole yeah. new group of people gotcha. um and so that was kind of my first pretty bitter bitter taste of, of formula one um and then i was i was kind of very lucky because i i developed you know relationships in the paddock during my time there and was um able to once i kind of left slash got fired from caterham was able to immediately kind of move over to to Marussia and kind of start my relationship with them and um, immediately became their their reserve driver and um, I think everyone is is aware of that kind of incident that happened in August um, which was kind of two a month and a half two months after I had signed the deal with Marussia where they announced me last minute to compete in the in the spa Frankershaw Grand Prix, the Belgian Grand Prix, right. um, in replace of, of Max Chilton. Mm -hmm. And so I went through the whole process that Thursday of, of doing all the media requirements and um, evaluations and stayed at the track till 2 a.m. with the engineers getting everything right and do free practice one Friday morning, get out of the car, and they're like, you're done for the weekend. Max is back in the car for oh. free practice two. Okay. So that was Sorry, my kind something. of second second bitter taste of, yeah. of F1. I mean, I, cool I understood it because ultimately it, it was my role to fill in if, if for whatever reason another driver couldn't. But to go through that whole process um, was obviously heartbreaking. And then fast forward through uh, 2014 and we had Jules's incident in Suzuka, um, which really kind of derailed that whole organization for good reason jules was was kind of the heart and soul of that team and um excuse me had a you there had an incoming facetime there so jules was the uh the heart and soul of, of that organization and he was in a, in a state where we didn't really know um what what was gonna what what his life was gonna be like and yeah. so immediately after suzuka was the russian grand prix and so they kind of, we all left Suzuka kind of not knowing what to think or what to say. We go to Russia and they were like, okay, you're going to be on standby. Um, you know, obviously Jules won't be in the car. Um, so it kind of goes through that whole process again of, of you know, getting mentally ready yeah. um, to, to fill in. And then we made the decision out of, out of respect for Jules and his family to only run one car that weekend, which ultimately I'm, I'm very glad that we did. It was yeah. the right decision. Um, it was just too quick. It, it was, definitely, there wasn't enough time uh, between. So we fast forward um, and we kind of, the team financially is, is in a difficult spot because um, you know, that they were a Ferrari supported team through Jules Um and they were always kind of a, a team that was on a, on a shoestring budget. And, and like I said, their, their whole world was, was rocked, um, in, in Suzuka. So Austin and, and the U S Grand Prix was going to be, was a question mark. And we were like, we're going to try and go. And, um, you know, ultimately that's going to be your debut and, and that's what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go kind of through the whole process again, go out to, come back to the States, um, get myself ready to do that. And, and, you know, the Bianchi family was, was good with that. And, and everyone felt good about, about that car kind of returning to the track. Cause you know, we felt that enough time had, had passed yeah, you um, respect, to, to, yeah. to, to pay respect to Jules. Yeah. yeah. So 
I'm in Austin and get the phone call on the Tuesday saying the team are not going. So ah. kind of go on that, that roller coaster again um, to, to find out that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not making my Grand Prix debut. Okay. Something so like I'm that. at the track and I kind of, uh, you know, go through the motions and, 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 um, you know, just try and represent the team as best as I can for any of the partners or whatever that they were already going to go there and be there. Well, and so that was kind of the, the end of it, or, or so I thought. And I was kind of, quite frankly, over Europe, not because of anything that, that, that Manor had done, um, just over, over all of it um, that I kind of experienced since 2009. And, you know, we didn't really have any prospects for, for 2015. And so I started talking to IndyCar teams and um, was really close to, to signing with... Um, and it, well, sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting one more thing. So the, the final nail in the coffin for me was I was packing up my life in, in England. Um, I hadn't, I didn't have a deal in the States yet, but I knew that I needed to, to move back to the U S yeah, yeah. in England for months, not thinking that I was going to race in Europe. Yeah. And I got a phone call on a Monday morning. My flight was Monday evening to the States. Wow. And uh, I got a phone call from the, the team principal at, at Manor um, or Marussia, whatever it was at the time. I think it was wow. Manor. This, And uh, he was like, we're going to Abu Dhabi. We've got funding. We're going to go. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> and he said, can you be at the airport by 10 p.m.? I said, yes. Yeah, you don't okay. say no to that. <laughs> right. Of course. Yes, of course I can. Well, keep in mind that you lose – six hours or whatever and yeah, it's an eight hour flight or whatever so and i need to be there wednesday morning um so i immediately kind of get a friend that lived near me to get all of my stuff and take it to their house and i just packed a bag for the week mm-hmm. get on a plane and they say wait wait because we don't want you to get on it if this isn't going to happen so just wait okay well it's like an hour and a half before you know the plane's going to start boarding and I need to like check in and, and do all that. And uh, they were like, okay, we don't know yet. It's, it looks 99%. Like everything's good to go. Um, you know, we've got all the crew back. We've got flights booked. The cars are prepped. It's just a matter of getting them on a, on a plane to get to get to, to get to Abu Dhabi. Okay. Well, get a, get on the airplane. Um, and by the time I landed in Abu Dhabi, they weren't going. So this was again like the whole emotional ro- roller coaster oh, of making my F1 debut. So now fast forward to kind of what I was saying three yeah, minutes yeah. ago. It's like I'm I'm done. Like I'm over it. Like I just want to I just want to go race. Like this is this is ridiculous. Yeah, so that, yeah. um, really close to signing with a with an IndyCar team, Dale Coin Racing, um, for for 2015. And out of the blue, I get a phone call from Racing Engineering which was a, a, a very strong GP2 team, you know, in their time, they were, you know, kind of with ART and dams and, and um, I had always had a relationship with, with the, the, the man and woman who, who ran that team. And they were like, we've got funding. We would only need you to bring a little bit. Like, do you think you can make it happen? And this, this phone call came in like January and testing started in, in February. And I was like, I can probably make that happen. And like, give us a couple of weeks and sure enough, you know, it, it, it was, it was a green light. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to give this one final hurrah. I'm finally going to be with the GP2 team that is competitive. Can we, yeah. we can challenge, like, we'll give this a shot. So, um, 2015 starts and, you know, I still had my relationship with, with, with Manor. Um, there was no bad blood there. It was just, a wild ride for, for that whole organization, um, through those months. Mm -hmm. And we know our relationships got stronger and better throughout it. And, um, the, uh, um, season Jeep do season went well. I was, you know, in the hunt for race wins, we won three races kind of on the podium. We were there, thereabouts for the championship. Um, ended up ultimately finishing second in the championship. But the big thing was I got my finally F1 debut in Singapore (laughs) that year um, and, and replaced Roberto Miri um, for kind of the the final five rounds of that. So starting in Singapore and then Suzuka, Austin, Mexico, and, and uh, Mm -hmm. Brazil. 
And so, you know, we finished out the GP2 season, was able to finish out uh, most of the F1 season, except for, for Abu Dhabi, because there was a, a conflict. And um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. Everything, I kind of met their performance targets of, of beating my, my teammate, who was Will Stevens at the time, um, in, in both qualifying and racing. We didn't ride any cars off, and considering we were in year-old equipment, it was okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we matched the team's best finish um, of, of, of the year in, in Austin in the wet, and, and quite yeah. frankly, we were in the position to be in the points, um, but we, we missed a strategy call when we transitioned to, to dry tires. But right. anyways, it was, it was good. Everything that we could have done and, and hoped for, we got, um, and there was a deal done to, to, to go race in F1 in 2016, and life was good. So um, kind of went home for Christmas and, and got back to, to England in January and, um, you know, started training and testing was going to start in, in Hareth in middle or end of February and got a call that said they were going to, they were, they, they were going to go a different direction because they needed some help, some support financially. And, um, that year the drivers were, um, Pascal Werlein, who was a Mercedes junior driver and, and they had Mercedes support at this point. And it was an awesome car with, with a Mercedes power unit, obviously. And then the other driver was Rio Harianto. And I was, that was it. So um, where my kind of lucky break came or if you want to call it luck or, or God's plan or whatever, um, I got a phone call literally within five days of that completely coincidentally from Michael Andretti saying we have a fourth car that we're entering that we've never had before because they were always predominantly a three car team, Yeah, but they weren't. The, with a with a smaller team, which is Brian Hurd Autosport, we have a fourth car. Would you be interested? We know that your your F one deal kind of is fizzling out, and I was like, sure enough, Michael, I I would be. And he was like, okay. So I flew that that week to uh, Indianapolis, signed the deal, was testing in Florida, like eight days later, um, and four races later in my first super speedway race, we somehow won the Indy 500 and, and now here we are in 2021. So that's the, that's the long and short of it. Wow. What a story, man. That's incredible. Cause yeah, I would have said um, drive off with such incredible talent. When you look at the records, you can just like five races. Like, what happened? But actually listening to that story to even get one race there. seemed quite lucky. You seem to be yeah, very unlucky with your being able to start a race. It never really seemed to quite happen, but no, finally got out there sorry you for go, sure sir. i i feel like there's a little bit of unfinished business because like you know you want to do it Ooh. right ultimately no absolutely. <laughs> i feel so lucky to to say I, I i made a formula one race start five of them got to race as an american at my home race which you know very few get to do just because there's so few Americans and there hadn't been an, an American F1 race for, for quite a span of time. Mm -hmm. So I feel so, so blessed to have had that opportunity. And then to, to be where I am now, I've never been happier in my racing career. So quite frankly, it all worked out just fine. Yeah, fair enough. No, that's good. Very positive to take from that. And um, as you said, then you got out of Formula One, went into IndyCar, and then the first year you win the Indy 500. Can you talk us through that race give us sort of an overview of what happened for anyone that might not know and then also that feeling when you passed the checkered flag and realized oh my god i've just won the indy 500 yeah um so that i mean i really shouldn't have won that race to be quite honest with you you know yeah. we were, were pretty good we we qualified qualified 11th for a rookie like that was pretty strong um we had days where we were kind of in the top five in the speed charts and I was happy with that. Like I was just trying to start my first 500 mile race, my first race on a super speedway, my second ever on a noble and just finish. And that so, is insane. Right. It's crazy. So <laughs> I no expectation to win that race. No one did. Um, and so, you know, through the first 60, 70 laps, we were kind of like in seventh or eighth. And I was like, man, we could, we could probably get a top five out of this thing with, if we just play our cards. Right. And so, the, the race kind of progressed and like we were in the top five and like we were with the leaders to a certain extent. I was like, okay, like this is going 
really well. Like, I hope this all stays as it is. And then we had um, a pit stop where we couldn't get the fuel probe in. Mm -hmm. And so, and it was actually under yellow. So I lost 20 something spots in pit lane, went all the way to the back. But at this point, we weren't quite to halfway yet. And I was like, okay, I mean, there's still half the race left. And, and my strategist and, and car owner, Brian Herta, who had won um, as, a, as, a, as a team owner of 500 already with Dan Weldon, you know, he was like, yeah, well, we're still in this. Like, let's just get your head down and, and get back going. And we were quick enough to, like, get ourselves back to, like, 10th. I was like, man, we still got 60 laps left and we're back to 10th. Like, let's, let's give it a crack. And uh, came in for a pit stop again. Same thing happened. And at this point, like I was almost in tears because it was like, I'm not, I'm not thinking I'm going to win, but like you have that small taste of being at the front and now it gets taken away from you twice. And it's just like, that's, that's, that's heartbreaking. I remember so, hearing your team radio just being like, what, what's going on? Right. So yeah. Ryan was like, well, we're not really good at pit stops. So we're just going to skip one. Fair enough. <laughs> And so he came up with this strategy where we were just going to not do the final pit stop. And we just had to stretch. We just had to stretch the mileage. And, and the crazy part about it was it was a number that like the farthest anyone had gone on a, on a, on a tank before was like 30, 31 laps. And we needed to go 36 laps. So five laps. So, I mean, that's 12 and a half miles at 230 miles an hour. Like that's, that's a you would think impossible. Yeah completely impossible yeah and so he gave me this fuel number that i needed to hit and i was like there's no there's no chance like i was 15 10 percent away from it and then i actually made a mistake in turn two and like almost crashed but didn't and i came across the line and the fuel number was what it needed to be and i was like okay so i just kind of kept duplicating that without almost crashing and I was able to hit the number. And so here's the thing. So we knew, we always knew that we were going to run out of gas on the last lap. Like that was just given. It was just a matter of when, and would we be coasting down from a high enough speed to make it across the line? And would we have a big enough gap on some place to actually pull it off? Well, sure enough, we start the final lap in the lead and had a, had a 17 second lead and the car, started kind of coughing through turn two which at this point you still have got like almost two miles to go oh my goodness um, that must be terrifying <laughs> it was like just go full throttle and just try and get to as high a speed as possible to coast down oh, from yeah so okay accelerate all the way down the back straight and then in turn three engine off and so at this point it's just pull the clutch and you just start rolling right. and like from you to start finish is like is a mile i'd say and but i mean you're traveling at 230 miles an hour so it's it's gonna you're gonna finish it pretty quickly well we started the lap with a 17 second lead and ended with like a four second lead so it, it was as close as it could have been and we crossed the line 120 odd miles an hour so 100 miles an hour slower than we should have been right. um but ultimately when the 100 starting of the indianapolis 500 so that was a a wild day couldn't believe i won um couldn't believe i won for like weeks after that and, um, but it's, it's, it's amazing because it, it allowed me to kind of build this relationship with Andretti Autosport with Honda and with Napa Auto Parts, who's, who's my primary partner now. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, we've built a, a really strong team and, and now we're fighting for the 500 every year. And, uh, you know, barring last year, you know, we've been in the championship hunt ever since. So, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty cool how it all worked out. Yeah. 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 No, honestly, like people wouldn't believe that story if it wasn't filmed it's so crazy like wow what a what a race to win but an incredible story there from uh from alexander rossi thank you for that and yeah as you say napa your 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 sponsor i've seen the, the new uh livery that you posted on instagram for next year it looks beautiful mate i love it i'm looking forward to seeing that go around the track so but. yeah like it uh it, it's it's very cool they've never been involved in indycar before and uh we we brought a new name brand company to the sport so it's, it's always a good thing awesome always a good thing to bring uh yeah more money in sports keeps us going we get to watch more racing so perfect but uh sure. yeah that's all for my asking of you today sir but i do have a couple of fan questions that people have submitted sure. if you wouldn't mind uh, answering those as well 
So we shall get into those. So at Vehicle Valhalla on Twitter asks, what was the most surprising difference between racing in F1 compared to IndyCar? Um, well, I mean, the, the biggest thing is like you can win. You know, in F1, right. you're, you're only going to win if you're in one of two cars. So mm. four cars, maybe. Um, maybe just two now, yeah. <laughs> yeah two, let's be honest. So it's... Uh, that that's the biggest thing is is you know when you're when you're in the off season when you're leading into race weekends and you're training you're preparing like it's hard to keep the motivation to the level it okay. needs to be when you know you're going to finish 16th if everything goes perfectly yeah. right so to to be able to come to a series and know you can get back to the podium and winning races you know that's the biggest difference you know when you talk about the cars you know formula one cars are the pinnacle of technology and motorsports and they're awesome i mean they're they're phenomenal pieces of equipment they're also astronomically expensive and it's not a competitive championship because of because of that reason so there's a lot of 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 pros and cons to both i'll be honest with you um indie cars are are relatively antiquated compared to to an f1 car um but they're a whole hell of a lot of fun to drive and um the racing's close and and like i said you can can go compete for wins Exactly, exactly. No, fantastic answer. No, Indy cars look so much fun to drive. I can definitely say that. Um, I'm very jealous of you, sir. Very jealous. Um, at Josh Revel YT on Twitter and at Triple Crown Racing on Instagram asked, is a return to Bathurst on the cards anytime soon? Yeah, I mean, yes, but in a very different um, capacity, not capacity, but it, I'm going to do it differently than the first time because it was an okay. absolute um i was way over my head trying to learn a v8 supercar and mount panorama in two days um so i i, I told i told uh michael andretti who is a co-owner of walk and andretti united the v8 team um i was like i will do it again but i have to do the 12 hours of bathurst in a gt3 car first so i want to be able to learn the track in a car that's more similar to what i'm used to you know you can left foot brake, it's got arrow, paddle shifting, all that sort of thing. So that when I go back to Bathurst, I'm purely trying to learn a car and not the track as well. Okay. Uh, okay. So I will be back when that is. I don't know, but I, I will definitely go back. All right, cool. Good plan. Good plan. We look forward to it. Look forward yeah. to it. And the final question was from Reese Mackinson on Twitter. He asked, what is your favorite takeaway? But I'm going to slightly change that up and ask you, if you're on death row, what would your final meal be? So a starter, a main course, and a dessert. What are you thinking? Wow. Okay. Um, a starter, main course, and dessert. Mm-hmm. Man, I'm not thinking. I can't think of starters right now. I'll come back to that. So okay, main okay. course come would be some sort of like, cream based lobster pasta dish right okay fancy wow yeah i mean it doesn't have to be lobster it could be like seafood but i don't, I don't okay care. okay um dessert would 100 percent be like apple pie oh it's very american to me i know yeah, very, very. um and a starter you know what i just had it two nights ago and um this is gonna blow everyone that listens to this mind alligator tail whoa it's really good. Like what it tastes. I mean, it's, it's basically like fried chicken, but it was awesome. So I'm gonna I, do have, that. I'm gonna do... I have had alligator tail before, and okay. I can confirm it's very nice. Right. So, so alligator tail, a lobster pasta dish, uh, and apple pie. And apple pie. Well, what a choice! That was a yeah. serious spread there for the death row meal, but amazing, mate. Well, thank you very much for uh, for chatting with me today. It's been an no absolute worries. honor to speak to you, and obviously, I wish you all the best with your future racing endeavors particularly indycar this year i'll be watching uh watching you very intently uh is there anything else you'd like to say before we go to the fans out there uh just thank you to all the fans who stuck with us all of racing and sports in general through this chaos of uh the, this past oh, almost 12 months since march so uh yeah. it's been it's been crazy for everyone and um hang in there stay safe and uh, we hope to see you all at a racetrack very very soon Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Lovely little message there. Thank you, sir. But um, yeah, that is all. Thank you, everyone, for watching or listening, whichever you're doing, of uh, this episode of the Chatterbox podcast. If you did enjoy, be sure to drop a like down below if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the Moto Meerkat channel as well for lots more future episodes. But otherwise, thank you again so much for watching and I will see all of you Meerkats later. Goodbye, guys. Goodbye, guys.